Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by TRX Dinosaurs. They have innovative puppets, poseable sculptures, and animatronics. And you can find out more at trxdinosaurs.com. This week we have Dinosaur of the Day at Sinoceratops. Which has appeared in trailers for the Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom movie. Indeed. And we have a bunch of dinosaur news. But first, as always, we would like to thank some of our patrons. This week we would like to thank... Scotty, Jackson, Megan Dixon, Kessler, Tristan Jules, Grandpa Dino, Rhinosaurus, Morgan Eklove, and Dr. Eigenbot just joined, so thank you. And as a side note, we just changed our Patreon. It used to be based on the amount that we got in donations from patrons, but we switched it over to the number of patrons so that it's a little bit more clear about when we're going to reach those milestones, and also just to encourage anybody who wants to donate but can't afford to donate at a higher amount, that it still helps us reach our goals. Yes, we appreciate any amount, any support. So you can check out our new-ish page at patreon.com slash I know dino. Yeah, we still need to update our video. It's getting a little old at this point. <laughs> but other things like rewards have been updated. Jumping right into the news... First, we have an article written by Dave Hone and Dan Schur, and we've interviewed both of them previously on the podcast. Hey, Dan's still doing work, even though he's retired. <laughs> yeah. Well, this one came out of Dinosaur National Monument, where he was the paleontologist for several decades. So I guess it's hard to replace that experience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this paper was published in Leth. Theia, I think is how you probably say it. I've never seen this journal before. It, they're talking about a juvenile diplodocoid femur, which is exposed in the rock wall at Dinosaur National Monument. And this one in particular appears to have bite marks on it. So specifically, this bone looks like it's from a juvenile, meaning that it's about five tons or less in weight, the total weight of the animal, not just the femur. So small. <laughs> yeah. Well, an adult diplodocoid was probably over 10 tons, so still small-ish <laughs> for, a, for a sauropod, you know. Honestly, though, if I was standing next to it, it would all just look very large. Well, yeah, me. the femur is, like, bigger than your torso, so... Oh, I was yes. saying the live <laughs> diplodocus. True. This bone has a major break about a third of the way down the bone, and when you glance at it, that's the main thing that I notice, at least... But above that, there are actually lighter scratch marks, which appear to be mostly parallel and have a decidedly tooth-likeness <laughs> to them. <laughs> Meaning, you know, it's about the right number of parallel lines to look like the mouth of a theropod kind of scraping at the bone. Ouch. Yeah. Well, odds are, by the time this was happening, the dinosaur was probably dead. But I'll get into that a little bit more later. So... <laughs> The scrape marks, too, also look a lot worse than they probably were initially due to erosion. So they gouge pretty deep into the bone, but it, they're saying that probably they were just relatively shallow grazing scrape marks that over time, you know, weathered into these bigger grooves because there are other grooves on the bone that are less deep. So they also went through, you know, a series of other possibly more likely causes and made sure that those weren't the cause. So the first one was, were they preparation marks from somebody using some kind of tool to prepare the bone out of the rock and accidentally scratched it a few times? Because, you know, that's possible. But they said, <laughs> this is kind of funny, the sandstone that they're buried in, in this rock wall, is incredibly easy to remove from the bone. It pretty much pops right off. And actually, that's a problem for Dinosaur National Monument because the bones tend to have this problem where they sort of fall out of the rock wall. And in this case, we're trying to keep all the bones in the rock wall because at Dinosaur National Monument, you can see all these bones partially excavated out of the rock. So they want them to stay partially in the rock, unlike most bones where you'd want them to pop out. But, you know, in this case, they don't do that. So it's unlikely that it's due to preparation marks and none of the other bones seem to have similar marks so again, unlikely. 
since Dinosaur National Monument is in the Morrison Formation, it's from the early Jurassic, and that's why they're saying Diplodocoid, but it also means that it's long before Tyrannosaurs were around, and that's where we find most dinosaur bite marks on herbivorous dinosaurs, it tends to be from Tyrannosaurs. <laughs> we mentioned that earlier episode about their extreme osteophagy, because they really like to bite bone and they can break it apart with their huge teeth and stuff like that. So it's not surprising that you find Tyrannosaur tooth marks on bone, but it couldn't have been in this case because there were no Tyrannosaurs around. Mystery. Yes. So they went through a few of the potential candidates for making these bite marks, and they say that it could have been an Allosaurus, but there were also several other large predators like Torvosaurus, which could have done the biting. Overall, though, I think they were leaning towards Allosaurus just because of the size and the tendency to find Allosaurus specimens in Dinosaur National Monument, so it kind of lines up. Unfortunately, they didn't find any nearby predator teeth, which is kind of the gold standard in <laughs> identifying tooth bite marks to a specific predator. They talked a little bit about whether this dinosaur was likely killed or scavenged, and there's a really strange combination of features with the bite mark. So there's some evidence for killing as well as scavenging. I'm going to go through the killing evidence first. So one factor is the area where the bite marks took place on the bone is apparently a really tasty, meaty part of the sauropod leg, which likely means that it would have been one of the first choices for a predator. Sounds juicy. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's like a chicken leg kind of thing. So that's good evidence for... Ah, dark meat. Yeah. So that's good evidence for killing because, you know, if you kill the thing, you get first dibs on which part of the animal to go after, and that seems like one of the best spots to go after. And therefore, maybe it got killed. Also, if it tastes anything like chicken, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> also, there aren't very many teeth in the quarry in general, and if there was a lot of scavenging going on, we'd expect to see teeth sort of strewn about the place. And then finally... The other bones in the quarry didn't have very many bite marks, which also kind of works with the one about not finding teeth. It didn't seem like there was a lot of scavenging happening in the area. On the scavenging side of thing, the gouges are much deeper than are expected for a fresh kill. So even though it looked like the dinosaur that chewed on it was probably chewing on a really select part of the bone, you expect it to just kind of be chomping off the meat and not digging real deep and trying to get the last bits off near the bone. And they said that the gouges are a lot deeper than you'd expect for a fresh kill, going up to four millimeters or an eighth of an inch into the bone. They also said that you usually see those kinds of gouges in parts of the bone with less meat, so it's kind of weird that it's in this part of the bone at all, but if it is in that part of the bone, you'd expect it to be a little bit later in the process when there isn't as much meat around. Maybe it was really hungry. Yeah, that's true. That sort of works into their final hypothesis. And then the last thing about scavenging is that there's a lack of marks on the other end of the bone, and there's also a nearby bone that looked like it was probably related to this dinosaur, you know, possibly like another part of the dinosaur. And neither one of those had these big gouges in it, so that makes it seem like maybe this was the part that had remaining meat on it or was available to the scavenger for other reasons and therefore didn't have bite marks for that reason. So combining those weird pieces of evidence of both things that look like it got killed and then chewed on immediately versus scavenged and chewed on later, <laughs> they've decided that the most likely scenario is that it was moved, meaning it died, was transported, and then partially buried. And when that happened, the leg was sort of sticking out or otherwise the only part of the dinosaur that was available to be chewed on, and then the scavenger just went to town on that one spot. Oh, when you said moved, I thought you meant a predator moved it and hid it for later kind of thing. <laughs> like a dog? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's what they're going for. They did just say, you know, it died and was transported, so I suppose that could be it. But I think they're thinking more like a river, because they've talked before about Dinosaur National Monument appears to have been in more of like a river sort of setting where like water collected the bones and then on top of that it looks like it was moved because it's disarticulated a lot of the other bones are missing and the one that looks like it might be from the same animal isn't where you'd expect it to be if it was just where it was when it died so 
There was a really fun quote in there, though. They said, the deeper bites do show that large non-tyrannosaurid theropods were capable of biting deep into bone, even if it was not a common strategy, which I really enjoy because we're always talking about tyrannosaurs and their ability to really just crunch down on bone. But there weren't any tyrannosaurs around then, so it looks like at least Allosaurus or some other predator, because we can't really specifically say which one it was, did that at least once. <laughs> So be wary of them. They're not just belly floppers. Belly floppers? Yeah, when we did our Allosaurus dinosaur of the day, we talked about a lot of them been found with injuries. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that happens to T-Rex, too. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. And then, (laughs) one other aside, they said that the scrape marks on the bone might indicate that they were doing long bites with bird-like poles, and I'm assuming that's when you see... Jerky? Jerky motions? Well, yeah, but also just like that sort of tearing where they bite onto it and then like maybe put a foot on it or something and pull away at the meat to just Mm. kind of peck off a chunk of it rather than, you know, chewing it up like other animals might do. So if you're ever in Dinosaur National Monument, you have to keep an eye out for this bone that has bite marks on it. See if you can identify it. Up next, we've got an article that tries to answer the question of why were there so many large terrestrial predators at the same time in the Mesozoic that we don't see, for example, today. You tend to see a lot more herbivores and fewer predators. So Hassler and others in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B looked at an area, actually two areas, of late Jurassic to early Cretaceous dinosaurs, and they saw that there were very large theropods in multiple groups. So there were abelosaurids, carcharodontosaurids, and spinosaurids, as well as some large crocodilomorphs like Sarcosuchus. And all of those things needed a lot of food. So how could the environment have sustained all of these large predators? And their hypothesis is that maybe they were eating different things. The cool thing about it, though, is they came up with a way to test this hypothesis. And what they did was they decided to look at the calcium that was preserved in the dinosaurs. And dinosaurs essentially got all of their calcium from their food, almost certainly. So it can be a good indicator of what they were eating. So a little bit of background about calcium. It has a lot of isotopes, and an isotope is an atom of calcium that has varying numbers of neutrons. So every atom of calcium, by definition, has 20 protons. And you can tell that because it's number 20 on the periodic table little chemistry pop quiz. (laughs) And 97% of calcium is calcium 40, which means that it has 20 protons and 20 neutrons because you get the calcium X number by just adding together the number of protons and neutrons. But there are also two other pretty common isotopes. There's calcium 44, and it's 44 because it has four extra neutrons. If it had extra protons, it wouldn't be calcium anymore. So you know that's how it's calcium 44. And that accounts for about 2% of calcium, on the planet today. And then there's calcium 42, which just has the two extra neutrons, and that's about 0.6% of calcium. So they're both pretty easy to find, considering when you find any amount of calcium, you're finding just crazy numbers of these atoms. (laughs) If it's 0.6% of them, you're getting them all the time. And then what the researchers did was they calculated a ratio of calcium 44 to calcium 42 in these different animals. And the reason that that's useful is they found that that ratio is high in herbivorous dinosaurs, meaning in herbivorous dinosaur bones, and it's low in fish, meaning in fish scales from the time, except in some lungfish, which is kind of a weird outlier that sort of screws up the results potentially. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Yeah, it's never that simple. It'd be nice if, you know, for once this paleontology chemistry worked out the way you hoped it would, but... Never seems to. And I should also mention, both calcium 44 and 42 are incredibly stable. So the ratios of those atoms don't decay at all on geological time scales. so you don't have to worry about that. The cool thing about calcium is that it's stored in teeth and bone while the animal is alive, including in tooth enamel, which is incredibly resistant to chemical changes compared to other parts of the bone that are a little more spongy. And we have tons of dinosaur teeth because dinosaurs were growing teeth all the time and dropping them all over the place. So, for example, we have spinosaur teeth from all over the place, tons of different continents, but we only find spinosaur bones once in a while. 
So obviously the teeth are a lot easier to find and it's really useful in studies like this where you can use the teeth to do something. It's a pretty creative way to get more information. Yeah, it's really cool. I like it. And using enamel is clever too, that it's so resistant to chemical changes because the other parts of bone could potentially absorb calcium from the environment in the fossilization process oh, and it would yeah. screw up your results. So that's why they stuck to the enamel when they could. I think they used actually herb herbivore dinosaur teeth rather than bone too. I think earlier I said bone, but really specifically the teeth. Were they eating the cows of the Cretaceous? Wait, was this in the Cretaceous? No, it's Jurassic. Oh, it, darn. Well, it could have been. I don't remember specifically. It was kind of around the boundary between the Jurassic and Cretaceous. Because I was thinking, you've got the dinosaurs that are known as the cows of the Cretaceous, and we're checking their calcium levels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to get your, your calcium by eating the cows. Yeah. In other words, <laughs> that's funny. Another cool thing about this method is they only needed about 100 micrograms of material from the teeth in order to do the test and for your, you know, just for fun, <laughs> 100 micrograms is about the same weight as a single human eyelash. So that's very little material, especially considering a lot of these teeth are more than an inch long. You know, that's just a little tiny scraping. And, you know, people are pretty resistant to doing destructive tests but the smaller the destructive test is, the better. So it opens us up to being used more in the future. In the end, when they compiled all their ratios of calcium isotopes and their standards and all the good stuff, they estimated that non-spinosaurid dinosaurs in that time frame ate from 0 to 30% fish. So not a whole lot of fish. Spinosaurids ate between 0 and 100% fish. <laughs> That's quite a range. Yeah, it had pretty large error bars overlapping with both fish and herbivorous dinosaurs. But if you look at it specifically, based on their data, it looked like at least a couple of the dinosaurs probably only ate fish. And some of the spinosaurs, you could say, like, ate mostly fish. But I don't know if there's statistical power in a single sample, so I didn't really feel comfortable saying that. And then weirdly though, the big crocodilomorph Sarcosuchus, they said ate between 0 and 58% fish. And I would have thought that they were using that more as a control for eating fish because modern crocodilians are just eating fish all the time. But I guess this guy was huge. His teeth are just massive. So apparently they were eating some more land animals than we expected, or at least than I expected. I don't know, maybe people that more know more about Sarcosuchus are not surprised by this. <laughs> but in the end, at least it looks like spinosaurids probably ate significantly more fish than non-spinosaurid theropods based on their data. It's significantly farther down the calcium 44 to calcium 42 ratio. So at least it's more on that fish end of the spectrum than the non-spinosaurid theropods. And this could help to explain how all of these dinosaurs coexisted. You had spinosaurids eating fish, and you had the other theropods eating land animals. Now they're not competing directly, and you can have more of them around at once. I don't know how Sarcosuchus really fits into that, but... <laughs> it's just getting the scraps. <laughs> yeah, I guess, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I thought about, which I didn't see them mention in the paper, is that you could potentially see what dinosaurs ate at different ages since they're constantly making new teeth. So one problem if you try to use this kind of study on mammals is that we grow all our teeth at a pretty young age. So it'd be a good indication of what we're eating at a specific age, but not necessarily what we're eating as adults. But with dinosaurs, if you found juvenile teeth, that would be an indication of what the juveniles were eating, and then they're getting new teeth every couple of years, and it kind of gives you a record of what they were eating at different life stages. Oh, weird. Yeah, so it could be handy. We've talked before about how maybe a juvenile Tyrannosaurus or Allosaurus or something was eating small things like mammals or eggs or insects or something like that. And then as they grew up, they graduated to larger prey. You could maybe potentially figure that out by using this technology. That'd be cool. Yeah. You'd have to find a lot of teeth. But we have a lot of teeth already. But juvenile teeth too? Sure, I'm sure. Yeah. There's just teeth everywhere. <laughs> 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 Teeth are a dime a dozen compared to other fossils. Next in the news, in Saraguido, 
in Chile, a recent expedition that happened between February and March of this year led to finding what they think is going to be a new species of dinosaur. Ooh. It's all very recent, though, so they obviously need to still study it and then publish and all that. But there were 23 people who went on the expedition, and it was led by paleontologist Sergio Soto, and they found a semi-articulated specimen. Cool. So hopefully it doesn't take them too long to publish details. The more articulated, the better. That's what I always say. Do you? (laughs) No. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe I'll start always saying it now. (laughs) Semi-articulated is better than disarticulated. Yeah. Fully articulated or nearly fully articulated. That's really the money skeletons. Yeah. Really rolls off the tongue there. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That just means you found all the bones, basically. (laughs) In India, we've... Science Mag posted an article about how in India, paleontologists are having a harder time accessing fossil sites. And there's a whole bunch of reasons, partly because companies with the help of officials have been grabbing land, and so then landowners get protective of their land, and they Mm. don't always let people in. Uh, According to paleontologist Guntupali V.R. Prasad, quote, suspicion and hostility deny us access to fossil sites and seriously harm our work, end quote. There's also... A lot of issues with securing funding for paleontology and fossil sites are sometimes looted or developed Mm. by companies. And so as a result, paleontology is getting less popular among students. Oh, no. Yeah. And it's too bad because India has a lot of important fossil finds. They've found a lot of dinosaur eggs and dinosaur species. And this lack of interest actually started a while back, back in 1989, after a scandal where a geologist from Australia, John Talent, accused Indian paleontologist Vishwajit Gupta of claiming discoveries that couldn't be confirmed and describing specimens that have been found as Indian specimens, even though they'd been found outside of India. Or at least that's what he claimed. Yes. And Gupta was suspended from his university for a little bit, but then he kept his position after a long court battle, and he was there until 2002 when he retired. But Mm. since then, the article was saying paleontology in India has struggled to regain respect. Yeah, if you have to go to court over your research, that sounds a little rough. And then on top of that, there's some neglect on the government side where basically the government doesn't really protect sites. Hmm. So it's really easy for poachers to grab fossils. And then, as I mentioned before, landowners can just stop allowing people to access their sites. And Prasad also said that even fossils in museums are at risk because museums and universities don't have enough funding. And so sometimes after people retire, their collections are thrown away or forgotten in storage. No. Yeah. So it's not great. No. So because of all this, there's scientists who have lobbied to create a national repository for fossils. But so far, there hasn't been too much luck on that front. Hmm. There is some hope, though. There's a few big fossils that were found in the past couple of years. There were seven specimens of Shingrosaurus, which lived in the Triassic, that were found last summer. So we covered that in our news. Yeah, it sounds familiar. And there's also one man, Vishal Verma, who has been rescuing a lot of fossils by spending his own money to help secure the fossils and bring them to museums. Hmm. Yeah. And he even went into a lot of debt back in 2007 to haul a two-ton rock with a nest of dinosaur eggs out of Narmada Valley and help set up a display of it in a museum. Nice. Yeah. And his work has led to some really good stuff. Uh, Municipalities have established the Ashmada Fossil Museum in 1999, and there's also a fossil museum in the Ralamandal Wildlife Sanctuary that was established in 2013. And India's Madhya Pradesh state has set aside 90 hectares for a national dinosaur fossil park. And when it opens, they might display Verma's fossils in their museum. Nice. That would be awesome. We need more big dinosaur attractions. (laughs) (laughs) There kind of are a lot of them. Apparently not in India, though. Yeah, I had no idea all this stuff was going on in India. That is interesting. I think that's what most people would do, though, if you were worried about people grabbing your land or you know taking you to court the best thing to do is just kind of avoid it altogether and that's what people are doing 
It's also interesting because the rest of the world in that time period has been exploding with paleontologists because people saw Jurassic Park and things like that and got really amped about it. So lots of people in China, Argentina, the U.S., Russia, all over the place are going into paleontology. But in India, I guess that's one of the places they're not. Yeah, maybe it'll turn around. Yeah. And there are enough people maybe in other countries who, because I've heard that it's not the easiest thing to get a job in paleontology and there are so many people going into paleontology that maybe some people can, can go to India and help them out. Yeah, but that probably all comes down to funding. Yeah, that's true. We've got an update to the Paris auction that we talked about last week. So the two dinosaurs, Diplodocus and Allosaurus, sold for more than 1.4 million euros each. The Diplodocus went for 1.44 million and the Allosaurus went for 1.41 million. <laughs> Can't imagine. <laughs> that is a lot. But Although not, I mean, the Diplodocus looked really amazing. The Allosaurus looked pretty cool too. But that Diplodocus was awesome. The way they mounted it was really cool. True. They kind of curled it up so that it could fit into smaller spaces than like a huge museum room. <laughs> well, if they were marketing it as this trendy item for your living room, then yeah. yeah. It's still pretty tall, though. I can't, I mean, I've never been in a house, I don't think, that could fit that Diplodocus in it. The Allosaurus, I think I've seen places that you could fit it, but... Man, you need a big space, especially if you're going to display both of them, which it seems like they might if they bought both of them. Yes. Well, so that's all we know. The auction house that sold it said that the same foreign buyer acquired the two dinosaurs, and there are no other details. Yeah. Sounds like it's not going to be on public display. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> a little <laughs> pessimistic about it. I see that. Well, I feel like if I bought a dinosaur and I was going to put it on public display, I'd immediately start talking about it. Yeah. I don't know. I've never had uh, enough money to do that kind of auction. <laughs> True. Even attend an auction like that. Yeah. In Arkansas, Beaver, Arkansas specifically, there used to be a prehistoric themed amusement park called Dinosaur World. And recently an urban explorer, <laughs> I think is what he goes by, took some photos. <laughs> is Beaver, Arkansas urban? I don't know. <laughs> well an amusement park isn't nature exactly i suppose yeah. yeah this is sort of a crossover between the two i guess yeah so dinosaur world closed in 2005 after a fire that was probably caused by an arsonist oh yeah but the statues the dinosaur statues are still on the now abandoned 65 acre site the arsonist clearly did not burn down that much maybe they just burned down a building or something but not the dinosaur sculptures because it seems like there's still a lot of them around yeah it might have been their main building something that would deter them from reopening hmm. so dax ward that's the urban explorer took photos and they all have a pretty creepy vibe we actually mentioned dinosaur world back in episode 144 it looked like the photos showed some before and after shots hmm. because i saw one with a green t-rex with a not exactly yellow belly, but um, kind of yellow, not splotches, because it's definitely there on purpose, but spots, bigger than spots, because they take up the whole belly, almost like stripes. Anyway, and it's holding onto a fish in its mouth, and then next to that picture, it looks like it was the same T-Rex, except it's this rusty orange. There's paint missing from chunks of its body. And the fish looks rotten. Oh, no. Which is weird because it's definitely a statue of a fish. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. There's also a ceratopsian with bushes growing around and a little bit over it. And apparently local wildlife, like birds and beavers and deer, are living in the statues. <laughs> <laughs> there's also a large rusty looking sauropod with its tail dragging. And there's a tree that's covering its back. It looks like some of the branches just kind of sit there on its back but other than the trees and the bushes the landscape is in good shape and the article was saying the grass has been cut recently so somebody's kind of taking care of it oh interesting yeah so maybe they're considering reopening or something like that maybe or someone doesn't want it to be completely abandoned interesting yeah because in arkansas i think it's in the ozarks right mm -hmm. so it's very foresty <laughs> it would get retaken by the forest pretty quickly 
especially considering it's been over a decade now since it was closed, mm -hmm. if somebody didn't maintain it at least a little bit. Yeah, that's a good point. Wait, well, yeah, and coyotes hunt in the area at night. Nature. <laughs> Indeed. Speaking of dinosaur statues, though, in the UK, the iconic Horus, who's a sauropod dinosaur, used to be able to be seen between Cinderford and Gloucester has moved. Pretty sure we've talked about this before when it went missing or people were reporting Horus is missing. So Horus had been in the garden of the Forest of Dean pub, and that pub's closed. But Horus had been around since 1989 or so. And he disappeared a few months back. But the headline of this latest article said that he has fallen in love. <laughs> and he's gone to live with his girlfriend nearby in a different village. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, so Carol Mole, who used to own Horus, said, quote, Now he's gone to a good home with his girlfriend. Everybody should be happy for him. Somebody else had a dinosaur statue, I think, of a sauropod, and then offered to buy Horus. Mm, cool. So good for Horus. <laughs> in New Zealand, in Dundin, there's work to overhaul a playground known as the Dinosaur Park. The park was made back in the late 1960s, in 1966, and it's got a whale, a dinosaur slide, and sea serpent swings. It's a little bit of a tongue twister. A little bit. <laughs> so this overhaul is going to have their iconic pieces and rejuvenated play equipment. And the project is in the idea collecting phase. New equipment, they're saying it's got to be built to complement the existing equipment and it's got to be built to last at least 50 years. Wow. Yeah, it's going to be a community project. So hopefully they get more dinosaur things. Yeah, I hope so too. Yeah. That's some heavy duty playground equipment that lasts 50 years. Well, Jeez. That's what the current one is like now. Oh, yeah, I guess so. Maybe that probably requires at least repainting or something. <laughs> probably. Because that's a really long time for anything to be outdoors. Yeah. Got a controversial news item next. There's a video going around of Air National Guard Master Sergeant Robin Brown saying her oath of reenlistment using a dinosaur hand puppet, which... Garrett, I know you weren't sure if it was real, and then you were looking at the it by oh, frame yeah. by frame. Yeah, we downloaded the video and then looked at it frame by frame just to see, because some people were saying when she put her hand down after doing the whole oath that it seemed to disappear, so that maybe that it was like superimposed over her hand. But when you do it frame by frame, you can tell that it's just MPEG artifacting, which, if you're familiar with the way videos are encoded, when things move quickly, they tend to blur just because of the way that it works to save space, basically. They don't do full resolution shots of every image. And because of that, it makes it look like it disappears, but when her hand starts moving slowly again, down by her side, it pops back into clear focus. So I think it is a real video. Plus, there were some statements made by the military about it. And I don't think they would be making statements about it if it was fake. Sort of. There's no confirmation officially of whether or not this was an official reenlistment. But as I mentioned, this is a controversial news item. There are a lot of people who were really outraged, but then other people who seem to enjoy it. And even when we posted it on Facebook, we got a lot of conflicting comments. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, some people seem to think that it's not even that controversial for an enlistment video. But it seems like there are more people saying that it's offensive to people who have served. Yeah. So the video got a lot of views because it was posted on the unofficial Air Force Facebook page and Lieutenant General Scott Rice, director of the Air National Guard, saw it and shared it and said that he disapproved. And the incident is under investigation there's screenshots, as Garrett mentioned, that show somebody from the Tennessee military department saying that the ceremony was not official and that Brown was, quote, trying to create something her younger children would enjoy, end quote. But I don't think that's the official word on yeah, this. Yeah, I saw something else that said that that was fake or something. It's all, it's all mixed around. The whole thing <laughs> is controversial. Leave yeah, it, it at is. that. <laughs> For sure. It's a kind of cool dinosaur hand puppet. Just probably should have used it for something else in retrospect. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of the one that we saw Colin Trevorrow use. One of the first things we saw about Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, where it was just a little cell phone video of a T-Rex hand puppet moving around a little bit. It was that kind of little tiny 
puppet style thing. Yes. Kids would definitely like it. Yeah. Speaking of Jurassic World, though, we've got some news coming in August because, you know, you can't get enough of that inflatable T-Rex dinosaur costume. <laughs> There's going to be new inflatable dinosaur and pterosaur costumes. <laughs> According to io9, quote, Dino cosplay is apparently live, well, not at all concerned with anatomical accuracy, <laughs> as these new inflatable Thunder Lizard costumes reveal. <laughs> cool. So you can get a blue the Velociraptor costume, a Triceratops costume, and a Pteranodon costume. And blue and the Pteranodon cost about $70, and the Triceratops costs about $116. And just like the inflatable T-Rex one, there's a fan inside. Which keeps it inflated and looking like a dinosaur. Yes, not so much to cool you down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that they're doing this, but they do look kind of silly in the photos. Like the one of Blue, the way the hands are positioned, it reminds me of everybody walk the dinosaur and doing that kind of move. <laughs> Maybe we'll get one and dance to that song. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but with Blue, the tail is off the ground, which is kind of cool because with the T-Rex, it just kind of drags on the ground behind you. Yeah. I don't know. It's just one also picture of it that I saw. easier to walk in. Maybe, but I'm not sure if that's just because they kind of held it up for this picture to make it look more accurate, if it would actually look like that if you're wearing it in real life. You know, kind of like those kid videos for toys where they're doing all sorts of fabulous things that the toys don't really do. I'm not sure if that's going on with this tail. I don't think so because the Triceratops, <laughs> that one just looks like it, it's going to be, like, we're probably going to get it. <laughs> Because how could you not? I think we're almost certainly going to get it. But it looks so awkward. It looks like it's going to be really hard to walk in because you've got, well, the tail dragging and the, the whole back half. Yeah. And how do you walk around when you've got all this extra back half? Well, there's a lot of stuff behind and in front of you because the face viewing window it's is in the up. Frill. Yeah, it's in like the top of the frill. So it's got all that extra ceratopsian head sticking out in front of you which is like a third the length of a triceratops and then you've got the other third sticking out behind you or maybe more <laughs> but then your reaction garrett was because you see the person's hand sticking out i was like well at least your hands are free because <laughs> mm -hmm. in the t-rex <laughs> it comes with these little gloves and you can't really stick your arms all the way out of the suit because otherwise your arms are showing off because you know you're supposed to have little tiny t-rex arms so at least in this one, you could use your arms, although it looks ridiculous because you've got arms sticking out from behind the frill. Yeah. <laughs> but it's got this kind of cuteness factor to it. I don't know. Maybe because the Triceratops, the body is so compact. I think it looks pretty good. The Triceratops is probably the most anatomically realistic other than the human arm sticking out of the neck. Yeah. The least realistic one is the Pteranodon. Yeah. That one's not perfect. That one just looks silly to me. It looks like if Batman was a cartoon and had a weird head and puffy feet. Yeah, yeah. And maybe it's the pose in the picture, too. He's kind of spread out. Well, yeah, it's just a guy. You know, It looks like a guy with a Pteranodon head with his arms <laughs> held out. And because we're humans, it has hands at the ends of the arm. But real Pteranodons had their hands kind of in the middle of their arm. And then just the pinky grew way out. And what happens when you do it this way, the way that they did for the inflatable costume, is there's just like weird cape material hanging down between yeah. the armpit and wrist and then hands at the end. And when you look at it, you're like, that looks wrong. But if you think about it, you realize like, oh, yeah, the fingers are in the wrong place. And this is just like a weird guy with like flaps under his wings, like a flying squirrel or something. That's probably why I thought of Batman. Yeah. Because it looks like a cape. It does. And it's the same kind of thing with Batman, where it's just these things hanging down below the arms and the normal hands at the end of the arms, rather than the wing being sort of part of the arm construction. So, yeah. They could have done it, though. They could have done it kind of like the T-Rex and added a pole or something to the end of the arm and had the wing stretch out to that and have the hand in the right spot like they did with the T-Rex where they forced you to have short arms. They could have forced you to have Then it's probably harder to move around. Think about getting through a doorway like that. Yeah, but I mean, you could just have your arms partially in the suit. You could have your elbows basically at your sides and then have poles. And then you're just holding the poles because they could fold their wings too in the middle. So you could just do that. You could twist them in or something. Then you're pretty limited in what you can do when you're making your videos. Well, you're limited in what you can do when you're wearing the T-Rex video too. And that hasn't stopped anybody. We saw somebody in a T-Rex costume doing American Ninja Warrior. It's not very limited. I know. That's my point. 
<laughs> because you could still do that in the Pteranodon costume, even if you had shorter arms. Oh, I see. I don't want that one. I want the other two. Yeah, the other two are where it's at. There's only two of us, so that works. <laughs> I got dibs on blue. Mm, we can trade. <laughs> it's one size fits all. The blue one looked like it was better for tall people than the Triceratops one. The Triceratops one doesn't look great for short people either. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose. And speaking of Jurassic World, we got a new trailer that just came out. Actually, two trailers. And spoiler alert, obviously, we're going to talk about what's in the trailers. So if you're avoiding trailers and information about them, then skip this new segment. So there were two trailers, like I said. One of them was a teaser trailer that was 30 seconds long. And then just a day before we're recording this, they released their final trailer, they called it, which was two and a half minutes long. And that one is pretty glorious. There are lots of new dinosaur shots in it of things. I think one of them is a T-Rex. There's what I believe is the Indoraptor or something. And a lot of stuff with blue. There's tons of stuff that looks like The Lost World, meaning Jurassic Park, The Lost World. Which is funny to me because the first Jurassic World was a lot like Jurassic Park. And then this is a lot like the first sequel to Jurassic Park. Kind of like what's going on with Star Wars where they're sort of recreating the arc. Oh no, what's <laughs> the third one going to be like? Oh yeah, that's, that could be bad. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason I say that is they show them tranquilizing dinosaurs to bring them back to the mainland. And they kind of show people, you know, looking at a dinosaur in a cage going way back to the... Arthur Conan Doyle Lost World and, you know, kind of King Kong sort of thing where you're bringing back dinosaurs or in the Lost World when they brought back the T-Rex to San Diego. It has that whole vibe to it. And then there's a really great scene where Jeff Goldblum says, welcome to Jurassic World, but in a really ominous voice, which is pretty <laughs> fun, kind of playing on that welcome to Jurassic Park from the original with John Hammond. So it looks pretty awesome. I'm glad that they're incorporating a little bit more than just being on the island with the volcano because i was wondering how they were going to turn that into a whole story when we just saw them running from the volcano i was like okay what are they going to do doesn't seem like a whole lot of story arc here but if they're incorporating the the real world off the island there's a lot more to do and i guess in retrospect i should have seen this coming because there's that movie poster essentially of the indoraptor reaching out to the little girl in the bed that was in one of the trailers too yeah and obviously the only way that happens is either if that little girl lives on an island, which is only dinosaurs, which probably would not be the case, or if dinosaurs are breaking loose in a city. So that's probably what's going on. And as an aside, they have the same super oversized mosasaur in this trailer that looks like it's going after some surfers. <laughs> it's a pretty cool shot. It reminds me of those photoshopped pictures of like a shark, shark yeah. yeah, in the wave, you know, going after surfers. And there's just dinosaurs chasing people all over the place, which is great. They know what the fans want. Yeah, I'm really excited. Can't come soon enough. But then what will we look forward to? Well, they already announced the third one. So oh, I got that's that true. One. Got years for that. Yeah. There's going to be... I've, I'm surprised there haven't been more spinoffs and dinosaur shows and things with how massively popular Jurassic World was. I'm expecting a bunch of stuff to come out. I guess there are other dinosaur movies that have come out this year like z-rex and things like that mm -hmm. you got to get through some of those oh yeah yeah we've got a long list <laughs> and last to wrap this all up and keep with the jurassic park jurassic world theme i've got a question from kessler about jurassic park a critical question he says <laughs> there's a famous scene in jurassic park a raptor breathes against the window and makes the fog and fogs up the glass and Kessler says, I thought they were cold-blooded, and if so, wouldn't that mean there wouldn't be a significant temperature difference to allow for that to happen, i.e. the raptor's breath wouldn't be significantly warmer than the glass? There's no indication it was basking in the sun immediately before it came in to try to kill everyone. And then he also said that he realized via Google that cold-bloodedness can be derived by growth rates since it is a function of metabolism, and that cold-bloodedness is not binary, it is a spectrum. And... Also, that the dinosaur, the velociraptor there, was very active, so that could have created heat. So we agree, yes. Super critical question, Kessler. <laughs> <laughs> and he's right. They definitely were at least mesotherms, which are in between cold and warm-blooded, basically. Right, Garrett? Yes. So they would have been able to fog the glass if the glass was cold enough. And Garrett got into details about all of this 
mesothermic, cold-blooded, warm-blooded, endothermic, ectothermic, everything thermic yep. <laughs> <laughs> in a couple episodes way, way back. Yeah, in episodes 27 and 49, we had discussions about it. Yes. So if you want to hear Garrett's rabbit holes for these, check out those episodes. But I can give a quick summary. Basically, what Kessler's referring to is since dinosaurs grew really, really rapidly, we assume that they were warm blooded because they had to be active to get enough food and to grow. And therefore, they probably were at least slightly warm blooded ish. There are modern things. I think sharks are one example where they're not really warm blooded in the same way that some mammals are, but they're so active that they are effectively warm blooded. And so that works. But as an aside to the aside, <laughs> when we talked to, I believe it was Jack Horner, he was mentioning this scene and that originally what they wanted to do was have a forked tongue yeah. stick out of the, snake. the velociraptor's mouth because they thought that would be spooky. And he convinced them to instead fog up the glass and leave the tongue a little more realistic to what dinosaurs probably had. So... Even if it is a little bit unrealistic because it didn't seem to be that cold in the kitchen and, you know, you don't fall glass just by breathing near it necessarily, it's a lot better than a forked tongue. So <laughs> no matter what, it was a good choice. <laughs> good job, Jack Horner. <laughs> yeah, I think it was Jack Horner. Yeah. Hopefully we're giving credit to the right person. And speaking of velociraptors, we have our dinosaur sculpture giveaway thanks to TRX Dinosaurs the makers of all sorts of puppets, posable sculptures, and animatronics. And they make all of their dinosaurs to order. So you can go to their website and put in whatever kind of dinosaur you want. Oh, you could ask for a Triceratops and then buy the inflatable Jurassic World Triceratops costume and then compare the two. I can tell you right now that the TRX one would be more realistic. Yes. <laughs> But which, what, what would you get? Would you get the sculpture or would you get the animatronic or a puppet? Ooh. I think I get a puppet. I was thinking sculpture because they're kind of posable. Oh, so you could pose next to it that way? Yeah. I so, yeah, I guess if you're in the costume, you couldn't really use the puppet. <laughs> It'd be kind of weird. It'd be sticking out of its neck. <laughs> well, your hand's already sticking out of its neck, so then you might as well add a puppet. So you'd have a floating <laughs> triceratops next to it that way? <laughs> I don't think so. I think you're right. Do the do the sculpture if you're going to do this random thing we're suggesting. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to win a TRX sculpture, we're giving away that realistic one-to-one -one scale Velociraptor. Not a Jurassic Park Velociraptor. This is the realistic version of a Jurassic... Scientifically accurate. Yes. So it's about six feet long and two feet tall, not six feet tall and you know, who knows how many feet long like it was in the movie. So if you're interested in winning this dinosaur, just click the giveaway link, which is in our show notes. And as a reminder, it's open to residents of the U.S. and Canada, except Quebec and where prohibited. There's no purchase necessary and a limit of one entry per household per episode. And you can get complete rules on our website. Or also, there's a link to the complete rules in our show notes. And that's there's a specific link each week so it's a different link per episode in, in the show notes yes from now until the giveaway ends which is when jurassic world fallen kingdom comes out yeah we were trying to think of a way to make sure that we gave the sculpture to someone who regularly listens to the episode and didn't just like find this link on a forum somewhere so we wanted to do multiple links so that people who regularly subscribe or whatever have access to the links easily so that was the only way we could think of, which was legal and easy to do. <laughs> there are a lot of legal restrictions on giveaways. It's amazing how hard it is to give away something for free. But <laughs> Yeah, when you put it like that. <laughs> yep. But I'm sure this Velociraptor will end up in a good home. Yes, I'm sure. Keeping our Jurassic World Fest going. <laughs> we've got the dinosaur of the day, Sinoceratops, which has appeared in trailers for Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. So we don't know exactly how it fits in yet, but it'll be there. Indeed. It was a centrosaurine ceratopsian that lived in the Cretaceous in what is now Shandong Province, China, in the Xingu Zhuang Formation. And it was found in 2008 and named in 2010 by Xu Xing and others. The type species is Sinoceratops juchengensis. And its name means Chinese horned face from Zhucheng. 
and Sina means China in Latin. The city of Juchang financed the excavations, and they found three skulls in Juchang, China. The holotype consists of a partial skull with a partial brain case. And Sinoceratops was a medium-sized quadrupedal herbivorous dinosaur. It's one of the largest known centrosaurines. It grew up to about 20 feet or 6 meters long and weighed up to 2 tons. Thomas Holtz Jr. estimated, though, that it could be up to 23 feet or 7 meters long and weigh 2.3 tons. So as I mentioned, Sinoceratops was a ceratopsian. It was actually the first ceratopsid found in China, and the only confirmed ceratopsid from Asia so far. And ceratopsids are advanced ceratopsians. And it has features seen in both centrosaurines and chasmosaurines. So it might help to show more about ceratopsian evolution and that ceratopsids evolved in Asia before going to North America, but we'll need more fossils to know for sure. Always the case. Sinoceratops had a short hooked nasal horn, but it did not have brow horns, and it had a short neck frill with forward curving hornlets that made it look like it had a crown. And this row of hornlets had low knobs on the top of the frill that's not found on any other ceratopsian. Other dinosaurs that lived at the same time and place include Shantungasaurus, a hadrosaurid, Juchen Ceratops, a ceratopsian, Huashiosaurus, another hadrosaurid, and Juchung Tyrannus, a theropod. You seeing a pattern in names? Yeah. <laughs> the funny thing about Sinoceratops in Jurassic World is that originally it was going to be a Pachyrhinosaurus, that one that's famous from Alberta, and it's got a big, they call it a nasal boss. It's kind of a big flat surface, sort of. It almost reminds me of like a calloused heel or something. It just looks <laughs> kind of gross but, Jeez. rather than a horde on its nose. So it's pretty distinctive. And originally that was what was going to be in Jurassic World. We know that because they released a toy that's called Sinoceratops, but it's clearly a Pachyrhinosaurus. Oh, so they yeah. reworked the Pachyrhinosaurus into a Sinoceratops, but apparently couldn't redo the toy in time. So there's all these Pachyrhinosauruses running around that are actually Sinoceratops. <laughs> and now you know. Yep. <laughs> and our fun fact of the day comes from Dr. Eigenbot, who pointed out to us that Jurassic Park was originally released on June 11th, 1993 in the U.S., which might be why Jurassic World 3 was announced for June 11th, 2021 already, because we were wondering why they've announced the date so far in advance. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, Jurassic World 1, I'm just calling that for clarity, so you know I'm not talking about Fallen Kingdom, came out on June 11th in the UK and the 12th in the US. And this year would be the 25th anniversary of Jurassic Park, but it's not coming out on the 11th. (laughs) Probably because the 11th is a Monday, so maybe that's why they picked the previous week for most of Europe. But then in the US, we have to wait an extra two weeks, even though when the first Jurassic World came out, it came out on the 11th and 12th everywhere in the world. Garrett is outraged. It's really annoying. And I was trying to find out online why they're doing this. Apparently, since 2012, a lot of movie studios have started doing this kind of staggered release thing. And it might be to try to increase buzz in the U.S. so that ticket sales go up. But it risks piracy is the problem that I see with it. Because if you don't release it everywhere, people in the U.S. who really want to see the movie are just going to download it illegally. And then, you know, they don't have to wait. Not that we would. No, we're not going to do that, but... Yeah, it sure is annoying. But on a, on the bright side, the original Jurassic Park, Europe had to wait over three months, a lot of them did, to get it. So at least we only have to wait two weeks. It's not as bad. Three months, that's a long time. <laughs> it is. It was the first one, so they might not have known that it would be so big, but mm-hmm. still, that's a long time. And I guess back then, they probably had to mail film and stuff like that. They couldn't just send you a file to your projector. You start it up the next day. Yeah, good point. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Hope you enjoyed all of the Jurassic Park and (laughs) Jurassic World talk. (laughs) It's heating up. It is. We're getting close. (laughs) Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes, including reminders to enter our giveaway and a chance to win the Velociraptor sculpture. And yeah, if you know anyone who might want that sculpture, tell your friends. Yep, and then they can enter to win also. You can also... Get some extra posts and content from us on Patreon at patreon.com slash I know dino. 
Thanks again. And until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at I Know Dino.